Hello students, welcome to lecture 12 of the online course on nanophotonics plus monics and metamaterials. Today we will be covering real and reciprocal lattices. So here is the lecture outline. So today we will have a look at the periodic electromagnetic devices like why we are studying these topics and where is the final objective. We will also go into the technical details like two dimensional lattices study about their symmetry operations. We will also understand the translational symmetry that is present in uh, this periodic devices. We will analyze the primitive lattice vectors, calculate the reciprocal lattice vectors, obtain Miller indices and also discuss about the brilliant zones. So, here is the final objective. So, as you can see we, we actually use a lot of periodic electromagnetic devices in our different applications starting from diffraction grating you might have heard of this diffraction gratings that allow you to split light into different colors so you can use it for spectral Im imaging you can use photonic crystals as waveguides for guiding light you can also have photonic crystal based fibers hollow core fibers okay then you can actually make band gap materials with a defect at the center which will allow you to uh, act this this will act as a resonator cavity the periodic structures can also form metamaterials as we have discussed initially that you can actually engineer the electromagnetic properties of material using this kind of periodic arrangements obviously you can make antennas okay and slow wave devices. You can also make frequency selective surfaces that are also useful for say stealth application. So, you can understand that starting from you know optical benches to data communication on chip, data communication over uh, cables, resonator cavity, metamaterials, antennas, frequency selective surfaces all this application have you know they use periodic electromagnetic structures so that is why it is very important to understand the structures in little bit of details and that is the reason why we are discussing this photonic crystal that is the first example of the periodic devices we are dealing in this course in little bit of depth so let us first go and ask the question that what is a periodic structure. So if you look into periodicity that is present at the atomic scale. So all these atoms they actually have a periodic lattice in which the electrons or the, the elements are oriented or their, their positions. So different atoms they are all positioned in different um, lattice points. And if you copy that natural thing into your engineered object, you can also make periodic arrangement of different structures which are periodic in two dimension or three dimension depending on your application need. So here also you have you know large scale periodicity. Here we have discussed about atomic scale periodicity. Now because it is periodicity, the math describing these things in both this atomic scale and large scale they are basically same. Now, how do you describe periodic structures? There is an infinite number of ways that the structures can be periodic. Despite this, we need to find a way to describe and classify periodic lattices. So, we have to make generalization to do this. So, what are the generalization? So, let us see that we can classify periodic structures into 230 space groups which can be classified into say, 32 crystal groups or you can say they can be classified into 14 brevised lattices. I believe from the material science kind of courses uh, you might have heard about the 14 brevised lattices that is present and they also fall under 7 crystal systems. So, these are kind of generalization. So, as you see, so this is as you go down 
they become less specific and they are becoming more generalized now what are these space groups these are set of all possible combinations of symmetry operations that restore the crystal to itself okay so what are the different possible combinations of operation you can perform on a particular crystal now if you take the example of the 14 bravais lattice they basically are the primitive lattices that means these are set of all possible ways a lattice can be periodic if composed of identical spheres placed at the lattice points so these are like lattices are the structure at which you can repeat the unit cell so here if you take identical spheres as your unit cell that you can place at, at, at every lattice point and that will create that uh, particular arrangement okay so when you talk about crystal systems Crystal systems are basically set of all Bravais lattices that have the same holohedry that means the shape of the conventional unit cell. So if you actually uh, look into the classification based on crystal systems there are only seven crystal systems okay. So here they are basically uh, the set of all Bravais lattices which have the same shape of the conventional unit cell. Let us look into some of these examples. So, if you take 2D Bravais lattices, so here you see this is one lattice. So, you look at the arrangement here, this is basically hexagonal. So, you see the green shaded region that shows a hexagonal shape. So, at each of this point, what is sitting there? It is a sphere or an atom or any other shape can actually sit here, okay. To uh, make this particular lattice. So, what are the important things you have to see that here the two lattice vectors they are equal in size and the angle between them is 120 degree. So, that is hexagonal lattice. You can also have square lattice. So, here the two lattice vectors are equal in size and the angle between them is 90 degree. Make sense? In rectangular you have to understand that the two lattice vectors are no longer equal okay so this will be longer and this will be shorter but the angle between them has to be 90 degree there can be other shape like rhombic or centered rectangular like this it's a rectangle with one at the center so in that case this is how you now the two lattice vectors are related and here also the angle requirement is not 90 degree you can also have oblique like this where modulus of t1 is not equal to 2 that means the two lattice vectors are not equal to each other and their angle is also not 90 degree. So, these are like two dimensional Bravais lattices. When we talk about symmetry operations these are the symmetry operations we discuss. So, one is called pure translation it means moving. So, if you move these to this point okay the lattice orientation remains same. So, this is translation symmetry. Then you have rotation symmetry. So, if you take this one and rotate it like this, okay, you see upon this kind of rotation, it again gets back to the same shape. So, this is called rotation symmetry. Then you take this one, this is called reflection symmetry. So, if you take this part and take reflection of it, you will see you will get up the same kind of shape. So, this is rot rotation symmetry. And you can also try any combination of this translation, rotation and reflection. Sorry, this is called reflection symmetry. So, you can have any combination of translation, rotation and reflection and that combination also give you a identical kind of transformation. So, these are called you know symmetry operations. Now, with that let us try to understand the primitive and non-primitive lattice vectors in more details. So, as we understood that the axis vector define the shape and the orientation of the unit cell. They cannot uniquely describe all 14 Bravais lattices, but they could uniquely describe the 7 crystal system. Okay? So, the translational vectors they connect adjacent points in the lattice and can uniquely describe the 14 
Bravais lattices. So these are the two important thing. One is excess vectors, which are good for uh, seven crystal systems, but not good for the Bravais lattices. Whereas the translational vectors are good for the Bravais lattices. Okay. Now the primitive lattice vectors are nothing but the po smallest possible vectors that can describe the unit cell. We'll take this an, as an example. So if you take this as your unit cell. As you can see, this is basically a BCC structure, body centered cubic structured. Okay. And here you can see that you have taken these are the three vectors. So you can say these are the primitive axis vectors. Whereas if you try to um, take the center point, from the center point, if you are trying to connect the vectors to the adjacent three points, that is the primitive translational vector. Okay. So these are two different types of orientation, okay? Or you can say nomenclature or systems. So one is axis vector. This way they are defined. Another is translational vector. This is how they are defined. So almost always the level lattice vectors refer to translational vectors. So when we say lattice vectors, we basically mean these vectors which are able to uniquely describe the fault in Bravais lattices. So always remember like lattice vectors, you have to uniquely describe the lattices. That is why we go for translational vectors. Okay. Now this one, this is a primitive translational vector, this one and this one. How about this? This is also a vector which is, you know, integral multiple of that particular primitive vector. And then you have one along this side. So what about this one? Is this vector a primitive one? No, it is not a primitive one. Okay, the primitive ones are the um, smallest possible vectors. So these are the smallest possible vectors, not this one. Okay, so this is the primitive translational vector as you can see here, but this one is not the primitive one. So it's a non primitive translational vector. Now let's look into the translational symmetry. So continuous translational symmetry can be observed okay, in such a system where it is unchanged if we translate everything through the same distance in a certain distance, certain direction. Like if you go back here and you see that if you shift the entire system, okay, then it is actually the system is unchanged. So that kind of uh, symmetry is called translation symmetry. Okay. So given this information, we can determine the functional form of the system's modes. Now a system with traditional uh, or translational symmetry is unchanged by a translation through a displacement D. So where we are quantifying the thing here. Now for each T, we can define a translational vector T D cap, okay, which on operating on a function F R. So if you operate this T D cap, the translation on a function F R, it will shift the argument by the distance D. And what do we want? We want, you know, they after the translation, it should be same as the original system. Now a system with con continuous translational symmetry in the z direction is basically invariant under all the TDS that can have in the particular direction. Okay? So continuous translational symmetry means if a system for any value of d is able to repeat itself that is like a continuous translational symmetry system. Now what sort of function is an eigenvalue of all these TDS? Okay? We can prove that a mode with the functional form e to the power i k z is the eigen function of any translational operator in z direction. How it works? It works like this. So if you take this translation operator okay, at any uh, translation for any distance say d that works on this one. So that will actually shift the argument by d. So how it shifts e to the power i k z minus d. So that can be written as e to the power minus i k d times e to the power i k z. So this becomes a eigenvalue equation okay, 
and this is the eigen function right this is the eigen value this is the eigen function okay so the eigen value is e to the power minus i k t so this is happening for any kind of translation continuous translation now what about we have discrete translational symmetry it means you cannot repeat at any arbitrary distance but at a defined distance you, if you repeat the system you will see the same property that is what is called uh, discrete translational symmetry now photonic crystals which are man made crystals okay like traditional crystals of atoms or molecules they do not have continuous um, translational symmetry rather photonic crystals will exhibit discrete translational symmetry that means they are not invariant under translation of any distance but they will work for a given distance and its integral multiple okay so you can actually take this particular example as you can see that it is a 1d for periodic crystal or photonic crystal where it is periodic along the y axis okay so what is the period here it is the shown in this box so this particular is the unit cell that is being repeated and the repetition is happening at a distance of a okay so at any sample point at a or integral multiple of a in plus and minus direction you will have the same property so these are basically systems with discrete translational symmetry right now for this system we still have continuous translational symmetry is there but that is along the x so here it is continuous okay along x direction the system is having uh, continuous translational symmetry but along y direction it is having discrete translational symmetry so the basic step length is the lattice constant a and the basic step vector is called the primitive lattice vector in this case what is the primitive lattice vector it will be bold a that is nothing but a y cap it means it is the it is along the y direction and the magnitude is a okay that is how you can actually define the primitive lattice vector now why only one vector because this is 1d periodic you are not bothered about what is happening in the other two dimensions so periodicity is only seen in y now for this system yeah so in this case what you can write that along y it is periodic along x it is also it is having um, continuous translational symmetry along y it is having discrete translational symmetry what is happening along z axis In, along z axis you will see that the permittivity is a function of the distance because it is changing with the coordinate z so here it is say the material is there when you go up you may have the material or may not have the material so it is basically changing okay and along y so what is happening the dielectric function you can say it continuously varies in the z direction so here you will see a continuous variation okay however along y you will see that it is varying discreetly like y r oh sorry epsilon r can be written as epsilon r plus minus a so whatever you are seeing at position r will can also be seen at position r plus a or r minus a now by repeating this translation okay you can see that epsilon r can be written as epsilon small r plus capital r so what is capital r it will be nothing but any integral multiple of the lattice period which is small a so r can be written as l a l is the integer these are very simple things okay now the dielectric unit that we have considered we consider to be repeated over and over just like this box is being repeated okay now what is this box called in good terms it is called unit cells okay because this is the thing that is being repeated periodically now in this example the unit cell is an xz slab of dielectric material 
which has got a width a in the y direction. So, if you describe your unit cell like this, it is clear that it is a 1D periodic structure. Now, because of the translational symmetries, eigenfunctions must commute with all of the translation operation in the x direction as well as the translation operators for lattice vectors that is r equals l a y in the y direction. So, with this knowledge, we can identify the modes of simultaneous eigenfunctions of both translational operators. So, there are two types of operator as I mentioned. So, you have this uh, T d x, it is the power i k x x that is along x, it is a continuous translational symmetry. So, this will be the eigenvalue operation okay? and along y, you have this discrete uh, translational symmetry and that happens along r that is l a integral multiple of the lattice period. So, these are the two you know um, translation operation that is happening and using this you can identify the modes of simultaneous eigenfunctions. Okay? Now, let us see how do you calculate the reciprocal lattice factors. Now, we can begin to classify the modes by specifying k x and k y. Okay? So, k x and k y they are in the momentum space. Right. Now, however, not all values of k y will yield different eigenvalues. Consider two modes, one with wave vector k y and another with wave vector k y plus 2 pi by a. Okay. Now, what is this 2 pi by a? a is the lattice constant. So, you can have uh, wave vector with these two values. Now, if you insert these values into the equations that you have seen here, these two equations, okay, they will show that they have the same T R cap eigenvalues. Okay. In fact, all of the modes with the wave vectors of the form k y plus m 2 pi by a, m is an integer, they will form a degenerate set and they all will have the same T r cap I can value of e to the power minus i k y l a. Okay? So, it means all these cases they will actually have the same eigenvalues. Now, this was done for say um, k y, right? So, augmenting k y by an integral multiple of b. So, if you define 2 pi by a as b. Okay? So, this is nothing but integral multiple of b. Okay? So, you understand that this will leave the state unchanged. So, you can actually call b equals b y cap as the primitive reciprocal lattice vector. Right? So, real lattice and reciprocal lattice. Reciprocal lattice is in the momentum space and there you can understand that whatever is you are adding integral multiple of that uh, thing that repeats. So, that will give you the uh, reciprocal lattice factor. Now, suppose we have a function f r that is periodic on a lattice. So, periodic means you can write that f of r will be same as f of small r plus capital R for all the vectors uh, capital R that translate the lattice into itself. So, it is repeating after this particular value of capital R. So, we have seen what is capital R that is basically small l a, l is integer, a is the lattice constant. right? Now, our dielectric function epsilon r can also be taken as this kind of function. So, instead of f, f was a generic one, you can think of a property, material property like permittivity that will also repeat using this particular relationship. And in this case, capital R is called the lattice vector. Okay? Now, if you consider a two dimensional arrangement, okay? so let us consider this particular picture which is a periodic uh, structure of identical parallel rods or tubes or veins. Veins will be like meshes. Okay, like grids like this. Okay, so you can 
assume these veins to be embedded in a homogeneous host medium and they are organized at the points of a rectangular lattice. So, what is happening here you can think of a you know square or rectangular lattice. So, rectangular lattice as I mentioned before that one lattice vector is not equal to the other lattice vector that is rectangular lattice, but you have to main, make sure the angle is 90 degree. Now, in this case the impermeability which is eta x y can be written as epsilon naught over epsilon x y. Now, this is also periodic in the transfer directions that is x and y. However, it is uniform along the z direction because there is no change in the z direction. It can be infinitely large the z direction. Okay? Now, if a 1 and a 2 are the periods in the x and y direction. So, if you consider the period here is a 1 and this is a 2. So, the shortage distance here will be a 1 and a 2. So, they are the lattice vectors. right? So, you can say that eta x y satisfies the translational symmetry relation given by this. So, what is that? Eta x plus m 1 a 1 comma y plus m 2 a 2 will be same as eta x y. So, that is how you can also understand that for all integer values of m 1 and m 2 this relation will be satisfied. So, this is a periodic 2D lattice. This periodic function is represented as a two dimensional Fourier series in the form of this one. So, any periodic function can be expressed as a Fourier series that you have learnt. So, eta x y can be written as all these different components here. Okay? You can write summation L1 starting from minus infinity to infinity, L2 starting from minus infinity to infinity, eta L1 L2 okay? and then you can have exponential minus j L1 G1 x exponential minus j L2 G2 x. Now, what are this G1 and G2? We have seen in the previous lecture, G1 is basically 2 pi by a 1 and g 2 is 2 pi by a 2. These are the fundamental spatial frequency along x and y direction. What will be the unit? Radian per mm. Okay? And L 1 g 1 and L 2 g 2 are nothing but their harmonics because any frequency, spatial frequency is fundamental frequency. If you multiply them with in integers, you will get their harmonics. Right? So, the coefficients that you have seen eta l 1 l 2 depend on the actual profile of the periodic function that is the size or the shape of the rods. So, let us look into the 2D um, Fourier transform of the periodic function. So, is composed of points on a rect rectilinear lattice as shown in B. So, this is the real lattice which is basically the lattice points are shown here. Okay. So, we have considered a rectangular lattice. So, this lattice vector is a 1, this is a 2, but when you convert it into the reciprocal lattice that is in the Fourier domain, okay, you went to the from space you have gone to momentum space. Okay. So, here you will call it k x and k y okay, and this lattice vectors are now 2 pi by a 1. So, it is g 1. Okay and g 2 okay. they can be yeah g 1 is 2 pi by a 1 g 2 is 2 pi by um, a 2 there I think there is a typo here okay. that, that can be corrected. So, this should have been g 1 and this is g 2. So, this is how you get the reciprocal lattice fine. Now, once you understood that how you get uh, the reciprocal lattice what are the optical modes of the medium with such symmetry that you have to find out. Okay? And there will be another important thing that what is this particular region that we have marked here. Okay? Now, if you consider the waves traveling in the direction parallel to the x y plane, the modes of the two dimensional block waves are given by u x y which can be written as p k x k y x y exponential minus j k x x exponential minus j k y y. 
where this is basically the periodic function with the same period as the medium. Now, if you consider this particular reciprocal lattice, the shaded region, the yellow shaded region here is basically the brilliant zone. So, how do you get brilliant zone? We will come to that. But uh, first of all, you have to remember that the wave that is shown here is basically having a pair of block wave numbers. It has got kx and ky. Right. So, another wave with block wave numbers like kx plus g1 and ky plus g2, okay, that will not be a new mode. Rather, they will kind of, uh, they will be same. As shown in the figure, a complete set of modes in the Fourier plane has block wave numbers located at points in the rectangle defined by this one. So, what is this one? So, kx is defined as um, minus g1 by 2 to g1 by plus g1 by 2 and ky will be defined as minus g2. So, this is 2 okay, minus g2 by 2 to plus g2 by 2 and this particular uh, rectangle is called the first brilliant zone. And why we are interested here? So, if you are able to calculate all the modes in this particular zone, we know it for the entire lattice. So, other symmetries may be used to reduce the set of independent block mode wave vectors within the brilliant zone. So, we will come to that uh, concept which is also known as how to find out the irreducible brilliant zone. So, when all the symmetries are included, the result in an area called irreducible, uh, the result is an area called uh, irreducible brilliant zone. Okay? So, we will take an example here that in this particular case, you can understand that this is basically a square okay, kind of shape. So, here what, what you can have, you know, you can actually look for rotational symmetry okay, and mirror symmetry. So, from that you can identify that uh, this rectangle, uh, sorry this square or rect uh, yeah, rectangle is better, it is a generic term because g1 and g2 are not same. So, let us take say this rectangle, if you take a mirror you get this one and then you put a mirror here the whole thing is formed. right? So, this is the uh, basic uh, brilliant zone. Okay? you can start with it and create the whole thing. However, taking only half of it because it is also having a rotational symmetry. So, if you take half of it and rotate it by 45 degree, you will get the other half. Okay? So, that way this becomes um, the irreducible brilliant zone and there are ways of marking it. So, you can actually mark this as gamma m x. So, what is m? m is the corner point, x is the midpoint of the edge. Right? Now, a two dimensional periodic structure comprising uh, parallel cylindrical holes are considered here. So, here one important thing as you can see they are not actually aligned in a, um, a rectangular or square lattice. So, if you connect all the center points of this uh, cylindrical holes. So, how do you make these holes? First of all, you take this uh, structure and then drill holes in this particular pattern. So, if you mark all the center points of this particular uh, holes, you will see this is the lattice. Okay? So, and from this lattice, this is the direct lattice. So, you can see this is A1, this is A2, both are equal and this angle is around 120 degrees. So, this is a hexagonal lattice. right? And or you can also call this as triangular lattice, there is another name for it. Okay? So, from this you can always convert it to the reciprocal lattice space and find out what is G1 and G2. Okay? And in this reciprocal lattice space you can identify the brilliant zone. How do you do the brilliant zone? Once again you take the one center point and then you connect it to all other points like this. Okay? So, you can draw these lines. And then you draw perpendicular bisector 
like this so you'll get this particular one for this one you draw another perpendicular bisector you get this one for this you draw another perpendicular bisector you get this one then you get this one for this line for this one you get this line for this one you get this line and that's it and then you paint this area with yellow and you can just show that this is your reciprocal lattice having this brilliant zone okay so this is the first brilliant zone okay and from this you can also identify as i mentioned you can use those rotational symmetry and uh, uh, mirror symmetry and all those things so you can identify what is the irreducible brilliant zone here you will see that you can identify only this triangle to carry all the information about the brilliant zone okay so that is how irreducible brilliant zone helps you to reduce the computation and but still give you the same amount of information of a brilliant zone okay so this we have already uh, covered so this is in the shape of a hexagon right now i think we have already discussed this for a given lattice with a um, set of lattice vectors r how can we determine all the reciprocal lattice vectors g so here we are um, naming the real lattice vectors as capital r and the reciprocal lattice vectors as capital g and let us find out you know that what is the relationship between this uh, g and r okay so we need to find all g such that if you do g dot r means if you multiply this okay there is this is some integer multiple of 2 pi for every value of r okay so how do you do that we know that every um, lattice vector r can be written in terms of its primitive lattice vector which are basically primitive lattice vectors are nothing but the shortest vectors pointing from one lattice point to another lattice point okay so for example if you take a simple cubic lattice with spacing say small a the vectors capital r can be written in the form of l a x plus m a y plus n a z so as you can see it's a cubic lattice so all the distances are basically same a and l m n these are basically integer now in general we call the let primitive lattice vectors there are names a1 a2 and a3 right and they need not be of unit length that is understood only uh, in certain cases they will be equal to each other okay or two may be equal one will be different or so on and we have already mentioned that the reciprocal lattice vectors which are denoted by g form a lattice of their own okay so it's a there is a real lattice and there is a reciprocal lattice now in fact the reciprocal lattice has a set of primitive vectors b i so there it is a i or you can say a1 a2 a3 here it will be b1 b2 b3 so it means every reciprocal lattice vector g can also be written as g equals l b1 plus m b2 plus uh, n b3 and so on where l m and are basically integers right so our requirement that you know g dot r is 2 pi n boils down to the requirement that this particular product that you have seen okay just to not to confuse that you know this l m and n should be equal you can actu actually mark them as l prime m prime and n prime okay that this integer values are basically different to this integer values but this multiplication should give you 2 pi n now for all the choices of l m n that you have seen okay there should be some value of n that holds that equation correct so if you put some thought you will see that you know only in the case when a i dot b j equals 2 pi this will happen if i and j are equal and if they are unequal okay okay this will be unequal there is a typo here you get zero okay it means compactly you can write that a i dot b j the two unit vectors when you multiply them if they are in the same direction you get this uh, value one okay if they are in different direction you get zero 
So, a i dot b j will give you 2 pi delta i j. Okay? This, this is how you can write it compactly. Now, given the set a 1, a 2 and a 3, our task is to then find out the corresponding set of the reciprocal uh, lattice vectors that is b 1, b 2 and b 3. And what is the condition? The condition boils down to a i dot b j should be equal to 2 pi delta i j. Now, one way to do this is to exploit a feature of the cross product. So, you remember this formula that x dot uh, x cross y equals 0 and that is happening for any vector basically. So, if you take x y as any vectors, if you uh, do this particular operation, you will get 0. So, using that you can also find out that in the the res primitive reciprocal lattice vectors can be obtained from the real lattice vectors using this formula. So, b1, b2, b3 can be obtained from a1, a2 and a3 using this particular relationships. Okay? Now, in summary, we can say that when we take the Fourier transform of a function that is periodic on lattice, we need only include the terms with wave vectors that are reciprocal lattice vectors. Now, to construct the reciprocal lattice vectors, we take the primitive lattice vectors and perform the operations that are given in this equation. Simple. Now, each direct lattice has a unique reciprocal lattice. So, if you have knowledge of one, you have the knowledge of another because they will correspond to uniquely to each other. So, if you take a direct lattice like this, so, the blue one shows the reciprocal, the uh, primitive lattice vectors here and in the green one, the capital ones are the showing the um, primitive red, let reciprocal lattice vectors. So, you can actually correlate this. So, if the direct lattice is simple cubic, your reciprocal lattice also turns out to be simple cubic. If you have BCC, when you do the reciprocal lattice, you will come up with FCC. If you have FCC, you will come up with VCC and if you have hexagonal, you will still come up with hexagonal. So, this is how you know they correspond to each other and this is how you can convert as I have already shown how to convert uh, the reciprocal lattice vectors. Okay? So, capital T1 and capital T2 are basically the reciprocal lattice vectors okay? and the blue ones are basically the small t1 and small t2 are the real lattice vectors. So, this is how you can actually you know get the values of each other. So, these are the values of how to obtain capital T1, capital T2, capital T3. This is for 3D system okay? and these are for 2D system. And all the reciprocal lattice vectors must be an integral a or integer combination of the primitive reciprocal lattice vector. That means, this T P Q R or it can be called as G capital G as you have seen, they will be nothing but um, capital P or L prime as you have seen before, capital T 1 that is the um, real, um, no sorry, this is the primitive reciprocal lattice vector T 1, T 2 and T 3. So, they are basically integers P Q T R all these are integers. Different books use different notation, just remember these concepts. Okay? And uh, the next important thing is to how to define the different planes using Miller indices. Now, Miller, Miller indices identify repeating planes within the periodic structures like crystals. So, if you look into the definition of reciprocal lattice vector, this is how we have defined just now. So, P, Q and R, they can be called as the Miller indices of the planes in the direct lattice, which is uh, described by a reciprocal lattice vector P, Q, R. So, let us see how it works. So, if you have a 1, 0, 0 plane, that means along x you have 1 and it does 0, 0 means it will be parallel to both y and c. 1, 1, 1 plane means it will cut all three axes at oh there is a one bar so one bar is minus one along x okay and then you have one along y and uh, 
1 along z so this is a particular plane that is given as this miller indices 1 bar 1 1 okay you can also have some more like this is if you try to write them in terms of the lattice vectors okay a1 a2 and a3 you can define them as 1 0 0 this one is this l origin one is 0 1 0 this one is 0 0 1 this is 1 1 and then 0 and so on so this is how miller indices help you identify repeating planes within periodic structures now the last thing that remains here is to see how do you construct um, Wigner's sage cell or the brilliant zone okay we will come to brilliant zone because the concept that we will see here in Wigner's sage cell Wigner's sage cell happens in real lattices and brilliant zone happens in reciprocal lattices but the concept is very similar okay and the construction of this uh, cell is also very similar so how do you construct it let's see so pick a point in the lattice to build the cell around so let us pick this particular point okay and then for this point construct planes that bisect the region between all adjacent points okay so from this point to this point this is the connecting line so you actually put a plane that bisects that region similarly for this to this you put another plane that bisects this region and so on so when you add up all this you will get this kind of a region unit cell region that is enclosed by all these planes okay so this is how the construction is done as you can see so from the center point to this point if you take midway you first take the connecting line midway you draw a plane so you basically get this kind of a um, section here then you have this plane this plane when all these planes add up they will give you this particular um, shape okay so whatever whatever you have done for wigner shish cell if you do the same thing in a reciprocal lattice you will basically get a brilliant zone okay so the construction of brilliant zone is exactly similar as the wigner shish cell just you have to do the same operation in reciprocal lattice now brilliant zone is closely related to wave vectors and diffraction so analysis of periodic structures is often performed in reciprocal lattice so that is how you know that the study of brilliant zone becomes very important okay and the reason is the brilliant zone is closely related to the wave vectors and diffraction so if you take the brilliant zone of a fcc structure that is basically a truncated octahedron like this of 14 uh, sides okay not slides it's 14 sides so this is basically the most symmetrical brilliant zone because it is almost spherical so you can say that fcc lattice is having the highest you know um, symmetry among all the brevis lattice so if you try to see the degree of symmetry for different type of uh, crystal and other structures you will see triclinic has got the lowest symmetry whereas diamond which is having fcc structure it has got the highest uh, symmetry okay and if you go for pseudo periodic like this they have even further increase in symmetry now these are the points of symmetry in a uh, brilliant zone so this is i am showing this in a uh, 3d crystal so if you take think of a um, planar one so if you take a um, cubic uh, crystal and if you then the important points are gamma m r and x so these are the points of the irreducible brilliant zone so this particular volume will contain all the information of your brilliant zone okay you do not need to compute it for the entire region you can only compute it for this one similarly if you take hexagonal then these points gamma k m l h and a so each of these points are defined here something like just read out one or two that m is basically the center of the rectangular phase so this is the rectangular phase this is the center there is another phase here what is this phase this is a hexagonal shape phase okay so what is l l is basically the middle of the edge 
that is joining the hexagonal shape face and the rectangular shape face so this point is l okay what is h h is basically the corner point k k is basically the midpoint of the edge that is joining two rectangular faces okay that is k as you can see here so these are the different irreducible brillouin zones okay which are very very important for finding um, photonic band structure as well and if you take this simple shape um, uh, cubic one and if you think only 2d so you will only have gamma m and x so if you take a cross section like this that will make this structure a 2d so you can only have gamma m and x here also you can think of this is a hexagonal one but if you take a um, 2d so you can get a 2d hexagonal lattice or a triangular lattice you can say so there you have gamma k m and gamma so only this part will be in the 2d right so that is the whole idea of having uh, irreducible brillouin zone as i mentioned that if this is your lattice and this is your unit cell okay so your objective would be to only find out the region that this region should replicate the entire one so if you take only this particular region as we have discussed before if you take a uh, flipped version of it here or rotate it here you can get this particular square and then you can use mirror on on the other side to get this left one so once you have the upper half you can put a mirror here and you can get the entire structure so it means if you only compute for this triangular region it will contain the same kind of information okay similarly in fcc lattice we have seen this is the brillouin zone which has got 14 uh, it's a octahedral shape with 14 sides in between if you actually identify this region which is the smallest volume of space within the brillouin zone that completely characterizes the periodic structure is called the irreducible brillouin zone so you cannot further reduce your brillouin zone so this is the minimum portion of the brillouin zone that is required to give you the overall property of the brillouin zone okay and that is why it is called irreducible brillouin zone and so two things here so this octahedral shape is the full brillouin zone this painted region here this volume is the irreducible brillouin zone and this will help us in reducing the computational burden okay for finding out different modes and the photonic band structure for this particular crystal or crystal uh, setup okay so with that we'll stop here today and uh, in case you have any doubt you can write me to this email address mentioning MOOC on the subject line thank you <music>